Let's look at how energy moves through communities and ecosystems. The most simplistic representation is the food chain. This is simplistic, but the first step to seeing how energy goes from one level to the next, the tiny photoplankton algae eaten by the smaller bivorous fish, sometimes eaten by bigger fish as well. Those are eaten by the next size up, the, the, the first level carnivores, and then the second level carnivores. Not only energy moves up food chains, but certain compounds that aren't broken down can accumulate at higher concentrations at each subsequent trophic level like toxins and poisons. DDT was a chemical used very widely to control insects eating plants in gardens and in agriculture. And after a few years, environmentalists started noticing fewer songbirds around because after all, who eats insects but songbirds? And later on, some of the top predator birds, eagles and condors, started not doing well either. Rachel Carson was an environmentalist who first made the public aware of this with her book, Silent Spring. So energy flows from producers to consumers, and then both of these die and are taken, the energy goes to decomposers. The primary producers are autotrophs or self-feeders. These include plants and other photosynthetic organisms like bacteria or cyanobacteria. Heterotrophs, those that feed on others, include herbivores or primary consumers secondary consumers, or you might say first-level carnivores, and tertiary consumers, sometimes even higher levels. So really in real life it's not just food chains but food webs with many participants at each level. At the bottom we have plants, the primary producers, eaten by insects mostly and larger herbivores as well, which are the primary consumers. And then secondary consumers, those that eat the herbivores, birds eating bugs, etc. And the tertiary consumers, the larger predators that eat those secondary consumers. At any level, organisms can eat from a number of levels below. At any, in any food web, usually diversity is greatest at the bottom, the, where the primary production is taking place, although this isn't always true in aquatic systems. The relative biomass of each can be represented in levels of a pyramid. And to me, pyramids are sort of funny because it, when I was in junior high, I remember the magic pyramid that could sharpen a razor blade when it was put in the center. But anyway, not only biomass, but numbers also occur in a pyramid. So I like this pyramid of energy diagram from our ecology textbook. The biggest uh, level of the pyramid is at the base, the plant level, and then the second level, the primary consumers are herbivores at this level. Then it starts to look like a birthday cake to me. The first order carnivores at this level. And this is because there's a large amount of energy lost at every step. When plant biomass is eaten by the herbivores, an awful lot of this doesn't go to make new herbivore biomass, but is used for energy and metabolism and so on. So the, by the time you get to the third trophic level, the second order carnivores, 
It's like a candle on the birthday cake. So the rate of energy supply to the rest of the ecosystem is determined by the rate of primary production, how much plant biomass is produced. Gross primary production is the total energy that primary producers assimilate. The net primary production is actually the new biomass that they produce. And the difference between gross productivity and net productivity is respiration. In other words, the energy consumed by the producers to maintain their bodies and to synthesize new compounds and parts. So here's a diagram to show that gross productivity or primary production is the sum of net primary productivity and respiration. So the leaf takes the energy from the sun and fixes that energy by photosynthesis and that's uh, the total assimilation is gross primary production. But then the part that goes to new biomass, maybe making new shoots and leaves or flowers and fruits, is part of it, and a lot of it is used in just living, respiration. So how do plant ecologists measure primary production? You can simply harvest biomass of plants and dry them out. So that's a measure of net primary productivity. People use gas exchange techniques. They look at how much gases come out in light and dark situations. And another way is to look at radioactive carbon to determine how much carbon is taken up by plants. A common way for terrestrial studies is to measure the amount of carbon uptake um, by using little chambers around leaves. And it would be harder to measure water and minerals, but that has been tr attempted also. Often in aquatic systems, people measure oxygen evolution, O2 evolution. And this is a study typically done in light bottles and then dark bottles that don't let in the sunlight. But for any kind of system, measuring carbohydrates, that is plant biomass, is a good, direct, simple way. It's surprising to me to realize that the photosynthetic efficiency of ecosystems is usually only 1 or 2 percent. An awful lot of the sun's energy is reflected off or absorbed in the Earth's surface or lost. And that's not a problem because usually there's no shortage of light. Photosynthesis can be limited by temperature, water, and nutrients, but usually not light. That's because it doesn't take much light to take plants up to their saturation point. And in this Sim, uh, figure you can see on the x-axis light intensity and on the y net primary production or new biomass that the plants make. At this compensation point photosynthesis balances respiration so any more than that can allow plants to build new tissues. And then beyond the saturation point the plants no longer can use any of that extra light. So here's how light and dark measures can tell us how much plants produce. We can measure how much carbon dioxide is taken up or put out in the light and then in the dark. And the difference is the net uptake used to make new tissues. And you add both of those together and you get gross primary production. In light and dark bottles used in aquatic systems, you can measure oxygen output to get the same sort of thing. So we can sometimes see in nutrient-poor systems the stimulating effects of adding extra nutrients. 
because in these cases nutrients limit primary production. But different species have different responses to added nitrogen and phosphorus depending on their own biologies, physiologies, etc. In this example from a study with California plants, Adenostoma acted typically like most species, growing more vigorously with added nitrogen. But Ceanothus, which has symbiotic nitrogen-fixing bacteria, didn't respond to additional nitrogen, but to additional phosphorus with greater growth. And annu annual plants, in general, responded to both in combination the most. These figures show that nutrient use efficiencies can varies a lot across tropical and temperate forests. In general, tropical forests are more productive than temperate forests in dry matter production measured as kilograms per hectare per year, but in part that's because plants can grow all year in most tropical places. But the graph on the left is nitrogen assimilation the dark dots being temperate forests, the yellow dots, tropical forests, and the one on the right, phosphorus assimilation. And here's a, a beautiful picture of the world showing net primary productivity on a color scale, with reds being the greatest, blues being the cool looking cooler and lower productivity and you can see that net primary productivity is the highest in the tropics and in the parts of the tropics that are the wettest.